turkey sandwich shit. Dude, I'd kill someone right now for a good turkey sandwich. <laughs> I'm so hungry. I would I would commit genocide. Fucking Chinese communists over here. <laughs> Especially uh Delron down here with his uh no camera. Very clearly he's a Chinese spy this time. Oh, very clearly. Or, sorry. I was about to do a really racist Chinese voice and decided <laughs> against it. Yeah, let's, uh, let's avoid that. Now. Uh, oh, so re- did Go Max ahead. did Max tell you about how he cock blocked himself? He's like he like future cock blocked himself, which is like a skill. It's pretty awesome. Um, how did you future? No. How does one future cock block themselves? Oh, just okay. listen up. Um. Hey, Kirby, can you tell me who's live before I say this? We're all live. I mean, who's watching? Can you tell? Um, it looks like no one right now. Okay, good. Um, all right. I mean, this is going on the episode. No, I I got in a little trouble for the last one. Um, and I'll tell you later. But, um, okay. So, uh, I have like, I decided to sort of do some light online dating since I, I, uh, ended things with my, my, sort of former partner and um you know i it wasn't like it's not like i'm looking to like i'm not i don't even know what i'm looking for i in fact i after this particular incident i decided to just to just not do it for a while because it's it's lame and it sucks and i hate it so um basically i started talking to this chick and um i had i'll just say this one thing i (laughs) I don't, I've dated women that are like just a few years younger than me, right? Like I'm 40 and this chick was 36. And I've noticed that there is kind of like an issue with that. I don't, it doesn't seem ever seem to work out. I don't know if it's the age or generational thing. But anyways, I started talking to her. Did you try talking to her about Transformers? I did actually. And that might've been a problem. (laughs) (laughs) No. No. You know, I think it's just, I don't do social media and like anyone who's just like on the edge of the generation before me, like really likes Instagram. Um, But yeah, so we started talking and she was pretty cool and she was really nice. And um, we went out uh, once and like things went well and she like kissed me. And then uh, I won't go into too much detail about the text messages that followed um that's the other thing chicks that are young a little younger than me are very very into doing things over text that i would never do um, keep in mind uh, max is called, basically it's, a... it's called sexting max yeah that's that's the new age term for it uh yeah listen for everybody listening out there max is basically what uh the new age would call a boomer um, <laughs> I would. I don't know if I'd go that far, but oh my okay, God. boomer. I, I am an old man. Let's just put it that way. Um. So yeah, we went out again. We went and saw. So I thought this would be fun, right? She was like, "Hey, do you want to go see um, she's the man with Amanda Bynes and Channing Tatum at at a theater that does like old '90s movies and shit." And I'm like, "Yeah, sure. That sounds like a great time." So we went early. It was like 11 a.m. And um, I could tell something was off because I was kind of ripping on the movie a little bit. And she wasn't really into it. And then we sat down and talked afterwards and I could really, she just was like a different chick, like not really talking a lot. And I was like, hey, is everything okay? And she's like, oh, I'm just tired. And I knew that was a lie. <laughs> and I, I, we, we, we parted ways. She kissed me. Um, and I got in the car and I thought to myself, I'm going to get a text in the next two hours, and she's going to say that she's not into me. I think I figured out where you fucked up. Hold on. Let let, let me pause right here. Okay. Um, Magic, Magic Mike was in theaters, all right? Uh, you could have, like, taken her to see that instead of, like, a well, movie he's... about a former uh, film star who goes on drug-filled rampages. Well, okay, Amanda Bynes wasn't on drugs. She's schizophrenic, but yeah. Um... <laughs> Anyways, uh, it was her idea. So, like, I thought, like, and she really likes that kind of shit, or like that kind of, likes that kind of shit, and I was like, okay, let's, we'll do this. But, yeah, um, so I get in the car, and sure enough, like, not even, like, I'm in the car for, like, maybe 15 minutes, and uh, I get a text, and it's, like, 
about like a short paragraph just saying like, hey, I don't think we're going to work. We don't have anything in common and blah, blah, blah. And like, and just kind of like that kind of shit. And I, and I thought to myself, the night, the, the, the night that we actually went out on the good the date that went pretty well, she was asking me about the podcast and I was like, maybe you like wait to listen to it. <laughs> like, don't listen to it right away. <laughs> and, uh, I kind of thought, so she texted me that and I, I, cause I was driving, I called her. I was like, Hey, I'm driving out. I'm like, I get it. It's cool. But just out of curiosity, did you listen to the podcast? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I did. Like, <laughs> I, bl- I blame <laughs> Alex. <laughs> All right. So are we saying, so is it the podcast? Uh, yeah. Like the way she answered it, it was definitely like she listened to any of the episodes that we've done. I mean, listen, I'm what's, gonna, what's I, wrong she with did, the podcast? She, she did say she listened to the, the Flying Dutchman and the episode afterwards. And I know both those episodes, I talked about some weird shit <laughs> relating to Flying Dutchman. So, so, all right, guys, listen, this is a shout out to all our fans. Uh, this lovely young gentleman over here is currently single and looking for a witchy lady who shares his interests in UFOs and ghosts and aliens. Uh, and this Chinese communist down here, uh, special guest Alex, or so he says, uh, is also single and looking for the ladies. Yeah. I just, you know how many times I've gotten the, uh, we just don't have anything in common thing. Like even my last relationship that lasted almost a year, like one of the big problems was like, I would go off on like a tangent or a rant about something I was passionate about, usually ghosts or aliens or the moon blowing up. I don't know, you know, anything science. And like, she just, it was hard for her to converse. And she, you know, she took it as like, I didn't care about her opinion or feelings, but like, you know, I don't know. I, I, I will say that, well, the one good thing I could ever always say about my ex-wife was like, she would like jump in and start like debating me. Like, and I almost appreciated that, but I, I came Just... to the realization after this, that I actually need to like focus on if I'm going to date, like finding someone who is into the same shit I'm into and or appreciates what I'm into. Yeah, I think the important one is appreciates what you're into. Because I think there's plenty of people that yeah. you don't necessarily need to have the same interests, right? Or yeah. the same hobbies. or But you need to at least like be able to appreciate somebody's hobbies. Or be yeah. like, I understand why you do it. Like, you know, I'll try my best to talk about it. Just know that it may not be right. Like, it's just that understanding. Yeah. Well, listen, I'll, I'll give you a great example, right? Uh, last night, I reconnected with an old friend on uh, MSN Messenger when I was shamelessly pimping the podcast. And um, we started talking about uh, aliens. And he was like, yeah, you know, aliens and government, you know. That this this government knowledge coming out, and all of a sudden I was like, yeah, but my main question is why, and then it followed like paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, yeah, you know, that's uh, yeah, okay, hey, I gotta go put the kids to bed. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, that's, that sounds like every relationship I've had in the last like year. <laughs> 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 I also think there's another thing that like I think may have like in this specific situation besides the podcast. The podcast was definitely the last straw. Like she had listened to it. I I I'm speculating, but I'm pretty sure I'm right on here. She had listened to it the night before that date because the night before that date everything was fine. And when we went to bed or whatever, I she listened to it right before that date or the night before it and like was like, Who the fuck is this guy? Well, well maybe you- we can Tone down the the podcast. No, don't no, drop the torch. Not. We gotta we gotta go PC, brother man. You no, think fucking not. John Keel toned down his goddamn books? No, no. I don't Do know not. who's John Keel. Who's oh, what? He, he wrote what? Um, the, the Mothman prophecies and the fickle oh, finger right, of right, fate. Right, right, right. Yeah, John yeah. Keel was uh, a part of most of the prominent supernatural happenings in the U.S. during the seventies and eighties. This dude was, like, everywhere. And yeah. so my mentality has and always will be, don't drop the torch. 
I agree. You know, I agree. And because he, was covered, he glistened with like with venereal juice. Yeah, he did. <laughs> you just need to find yourself a witchy chick, dude. And we're gonna go ahead and start the podcast, guys. Welcome to Crook and Murder. My name is uh, Kenny Crook Irish Kirby. You may know me as Beef Sea Dog, the awesome nickname I gave myself last episode, uh, based off how cool dragons is. What? And I'll be your host today. Uh, I am joined by Maxwell Murder. I am Maxwell Murder, and uh, you might also know me as what was it, Big Dick Cadillac? I don't know. <laughs> or okay. Or you might also know me as the guy who was screaming about anarchism on a first date not long ago. That's and that's how I get the ladies. And I'm also joined uh by our always special guest, Alex. Hi there. My name is special guest Alex. Welcome to our podcast. It's so nice for you to join us tonight. What the fuck is this? <laughs> this, this well, what is it? This is a Pee Wee's Playtime, okay? Whatever, Adult whatever, edition. Whatever, whatever I figure. It made me hard. I I'm just saying. He said he had a problem with the podcast with his dating life, so I figured, bring it back a little bit, make it a little smoother. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa! Are you who, who's that chick? Is that <laughs> Diane? Like the that, late night, you know, that, like this... Diane Keaton. Like, what, what do you no, mean, no, no. Diane? Like, what no, the no, fuck no. are you talking about? There's like the late night Diane chick where she's like, "Welcome to late night with Diane." This is for <laughs> I all don't you know. Lovely couples out like there. A, this is like a 900 number you dialed in like the 90s. Listen, what what I may or may not have dialed while drunk. All right, let's. <laughs> well, there's no it's... bearing on this podcast. It gets lonely out at sea. <laughs> like, are you using official fucking naval lines to call sex numbers, Kirby? And it's, well, you know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> All right. I, I, just picture Kirby like at the PBX station with a telephone. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> How much is this? A dollar a minute? Bill it to the Navy. They, they won't so, care. Everybody, welcome back to the podcast where we're going to talk about dreams oh, stop doing that okay i'll stop <laughs> <laughs> i'm getting confused here we're, okay and this uh in this week's episode we're gonna pick back up the science behind dreams that we started uh like a month or so ago and um and this one we're gonna we're gonna kind of go through the second half of that now i know there's a lot of esoteric meaning behind dreams guys and we will get to that. Those are two planned episodes in the future. Uh, but for this current one, we're basically sticking with the science and the facts. Yes, we are. And the science of dreams is super interesting. Um, I have enjoyed this, this series thoroughly. Um, uh, and I mean, we can just get into it because I this is this this episode especially. I'm gonna like. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about the themes of dreams. Uh, who dreams, why we dream, how we dream, what we dream, uh, where we dream. I, I have to say, the one thing that I really enjoyed about reading reading your, your outline, Kirby. Yeah. Your um, dream metaphors are in alphabetical order. I'm kind of a... <laughs> I'm kind of OCD about shit like that. So, oh, I love yeah. it. <laughs> so, okay. and we'll also be learning the alphabet on this episode of Sesame Street. A is for alligator. Okay. Go ahead and I'm kick us off. In. Okay. All right. So this is the this is spiritual dreams. The science of dreams part it's two. It's fucking not spiritual dreams. Spiritual dreams is in a month. This is scientific dream. Oh, you label it wrong. Okay. Did scientific I? dreams. Yeah. The spiritual dreams. Are you reading the right outline? Yeah, I'm on the second. Yeah. Because there's the spirituality of dreams, and then there's scientific. This, this one says it's just headed spiritual dreams. It's fine. Okay, science. We, we're still on the science of dreams. We're not talking about spirituality, okay? No, it says scientific dreams, too. Yeah, it literally says scientific dreams. What? I Max, think you might have the wrong outline. Oh, I am on the wrong one. Oh, you're shit. either in the wrong outline or in a parallel universe. Yeah, I'm... 
Okay, I'm an idiot. That's all right, guys. For all our good listeners out there, I'm sorry about this technical delay, but we'll be back soon. I'm confused. (laughs) Our our narrator is an idiot, but it's okay. (laughs) No, I actually, I I had it open. It's just, it was in a different tab. Sorry, my bad. Okay. Scientific dreams. Dreaming. There we go. Boom. Okay. Still in alphabetical order, too. All right. The dream, uh, the themes of dreams tend to be linked to the uh, suppression of unwanted thoughts, which lead to an increase of increased occurrence of that thought in dreams. In a study, fifteen good sleepers, <laughs> good sleepers, were asked to repress a thought five minutes prior to the dream. Dreams of of that suppressed thought appeared more frequently, uh, and caused a tendency towards more distressing themes. It also implied uh, that thought suppression could lead to a significant increase in mental disorder syndrome syndromes. Uh, external stimuli can also affect the emotional content of dreams. The positive s- smell of roses, for incident, instance, can lead to a more positively themed dreams. You know, now, honestly... Just quick question, though. So does that mean, like, while you're sleeping and someone holds, like, a turd up to your nose, you'll have, <laughs> like, more bad dreams? Or do they mean, like, just, like, before you go to bed, no, you while, smell a rose? Well, while you're sleeping, uh, if somebody comes and just farts in your face, uh, they can affect your dreams negatively. However, yeah, okay. if you're putting on, like, incense or uh, vanilla candles before you go to bed, though, don't do that. Um... It it can affect you to have a more positive dream. Wait, you're telling me it's a bad idea to have lit candles in bed with me while I'm sleeping? I always thought that was perfectly fine. For for you specifically, that's a good idea. <laughs> trying to kill Alex. <laughs> uh, I I go to sleep with uh, a lot of lit can like lit candles surrounding me, like on the bed. With a lit cigarette in my mouth. <laughs> and a can of gasoline right next to the bed, just in case I get thirsty during the night. Exactly. Oh my god, I knew a chick who accidentally drank uh, a nail polish remover. Oh. I, like, it was the, I, I was like, how did, she was like, I woke up and I was really thirsty and I grabbed, I thought I had a bottle next to my bed and I grabbed the nail polish remover and I was like, so, one, the bottle of nail polish remover is nothing like a bottle of water or cup or whatever. And two, like you swallowed it. You didn't immediately touch your lips and go. Yeah. yeah hold it's, on. What it's is acetone. she? Is she drinking like tiny vials of water? I don't, I have no idea. Like, so the like, nail polish remover comes in a little plastic thing and it's got this lid on it that like, you, she had to undo the lid. Like, how do you not, even before you smell it, how do you not even know that that's not water? Like, and yeah, she took one gulp and, like, actually swallowed it. And I was like, you, you swallowed acid. Like, how do you not smell the acetone? Like, well, so what happened? An, she called poison control and they were like, yeah, you'll be fine. And she threw it up and she felt like shit the next day. It was actually not too bad. Well, there you guys go. You could drink nail polish remover if you really need to. Well, I wouldn't say drink a lot of it. I think the fact that she, like, didn't, she, like, swallowed a little bit of it was, like, the whole thing. Um, but I, I just couldn't, like, I, I was like, there's so there's so many steps between that, uh, the bottle in your mouth that, like, indicate that it's not nail polish remover. You know, I bet her dream fucking sucked that night. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> that is one... That is one external stimuli that cannot make for good dreams. <laughs> virginity to that girl. I bet her dreams fucking suck that night too. Um, yeah, they're pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I won't talk about that. Um, anyway, I'll just say I learned to wear a condom after every after that every time. Oh dear God! Okay, so typical dream themes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so typical dream themes are those experienced by multiple different people. Here are 15 common ones. Uh, okay, my favorite, this is my favorite, sexual. Bounce, um, bow, wow. Yeah. Uh, falling, 
a living person being dead, a dead person being living, frozen with fright, swimming, insects and spiders, ooh, dying, being lost, seeing a UFO, seeing an angel, flying, falling, uh, or failing an exam, being chased or pursued, and mirrors. You know, I once had, had a, like, all those. a really bad spider dream one night. I was uh, sleeping in my waterbed back in Virginia, and uh, it was way back in the day. Way back in the day. Yeah, this is like way, way back in the day. Okay. Um, and I had just like conked myself unconscious with like booze, <laughs> and I threw the blanket over me, and I passed. Like I went to sleep, but it never. There was never that divide. You know how there's always that kind of divide where you got your eyes closed and yeah, for a minute you're going to, you're going to sleep. Your your brain starts thinking crazy ass thoughts and then you kind of fall asleep. Mm -hmm. That uh, happens to me every night. But mm -hmm. in fact, I even have like a weird moment in between the crazy ass thoughts and my sleep where I'm just like, that's a really fucking weird ass thought, and then it kind of blacks out. There was none of that. It just felt like I had thrown the pillow or the blanket over me. And I look at the end of the bed and this big black hairy leg like crawls up onto it. And then another one and then another one. And suddenly there was like a fucking spider like the size of like three Xboxes or four of them. Holy shit. Crawling up onto my bed. And I snapped awake in a second. I threw the blankets across the room. And I sat there panting and just staring at them. Uh, Ooh. and for about 10 minutes until I realized there was nothing crawling out of them. That's, a, that's I, not called going to sleep, that's called passing out. I grew up with somebody that had arachnophobia because when he was, ooh, I don't know, like a small child, you know, maybe like anywhere between like four and 10 or something like that. He had a nightmare where he was covered in spiders. Oh, Jesus. And well, and when he woke up, he was covered in thousands of spiders. Oh, are house. you serious? Jesus yep. fucking Christ. Oh, that's a, I, yeah. I have so, horrible arachnophobia, but that, and that, I think my arachnophobia comes from the fact that I'm a ginger. <laughs> and they just seems, beeline for you? Well, I don't know. It's like Ron in, in Harry Potter, he's like got horrible arachnophobia. I can't think of another example, but like, I, it, it feels like a meme or something. It's because your blood is sweeter. Yeah, that's it. And crazier. Your blood is very sweet. It's thick. Um, I've had all these. I've literally had uh, all of these. The mirrors, the... F well, actually, no, I haven't had a failing exam. I've never had that dream. But um, I've never had seeing an angel. Oh, I've seen weird shit, but yeah. I've never I've had shit. mirrors. Being uh, chased and being I lost is something I get a lot. You know, like if I'm having a bad dream, it's usually I'm being chased and I don't know who's chasing me, and then I get lost. I rarely have nightmares, and when I do, I typically kind of have this weird conscious thought in my head, like "fuck yeah, this is a nightmare, finally," because like I get them so rarely, and it's like actually kind of difficult to scare me nowadays. Uh. Last night, I got a little spooked because I was watching uh, Malum, the remake of uh, The Last Shift that they recently oh. released. And that's a pretty good film, especially at like 11 o'clock at night when every other light in your house is turned off and your and door is wide open. You're in a very quiet area of Utah. Yeah. <laughs> I like heard a thunk like halfway across the house and I'm like I'm going to have to go investigate that. <laughs> um the swimming one, I don't have I've never never had the swimming but I've had the drowning. I think that might be the same thing. Yeah. I think they probably are putting that in the same category. You know what I have a I, you know what a reoccurring dream is? I don't have a lot of nightmares either, but one that is reoccurring is um I'm holding a hand grenade and uh at first, it's, like, intact with the pin and the handle on there. And then I look down, and the pin and the handle are gone. And I'm like, oh, it's going to blow up. And then, like, I just stare at it for, like, 
what seems like a long ass time, and then I wake up. You know, you know that's gonna be the dream when you're on your deathbed and you're dying. God, it's gonna, no. it's gonna finally blow up in your dream, and that's oh, when you're gonna die. That would be fucking sick. It's yeah, like I'm this okay is exactly that. how I wanted to go. Yeah. Um. I don't know why the hand grenade. It's weird. I've uh, I've never. Let's see. I've been frozen with fright in a dream. I don't think I've ever been swimming or lost. Um, or flying. I might have been swimming. Uh, dying? No. Seeing a UFO? No. Seeing an angel? No. Uh, I've missed deadlines, uh, was my failing in exam. And mirrors, I have not seen. Um, I had, I had an experience of, uh, sleep paralysis when I was a kid, like, or teenager where I really thought I was being abducted by aliens. Like, I was dead convinced that was what was happening. Dude, maybe you were just abducted by aliens. Or I had popped a couple of Darvacet and a fucking Benadryl before bed and had a really weird dream. <laughs> Is that how you fucking get abducted? I gotta go out tomorrow. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go grab some shit. Yeah, I don't, they don't make Darvacet anymore, but I'm sure you can find something. Um, okay, we're going to jump back in. All right. Some dreams change over time. For instance, between 1956 and 2000, there was a reported increase of flying dreams, which coincides with the rise of air travel. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, same thing with, like, failing an exam, right? That's right. probably... Failing an exam has to be a dream only from the last, like... Centuries? Yeah, eight, yeah, 80 to 100 years or something yeah. like that. 100, 150 years. I mean... I've never had that one. My, my like, missed deadlines, aka failing an exam, uh, generally occurred after college. It would, like, it, it was a lot. It's funny, so it's funny that you say that. Because same thing here. I never had dreams like that while I was in school. It was only for the first few years that I stopped going to school that I started having dreams like that. Yeah, like missing classes and knowing that you missed And I'm so assuming much. that it probably has something to do with, like, you kind of changed your pattern throughout the day. So maybe it's something going on in your yeah. brain of, like, trying to – trying to get that pattern back or you know what I mean? Like something yeah. that you've been used to during your like conscious, you know, waking moments that, you know, your unconscious is trying to get back or something. I don't know. That yeah. Sense, or, actually. or the fact that, you know, it was a uh, stress. I mean, the stress yeah. mentality of college, just be like constantly having to make uh, homework in because now it's no longer like high school. You can't just fuck off. This is like you legitimately paid for these courses. You got to get them done. Uh, and I, I, I can kind of say that because I have the same kind of weird dreams with the Navy where like yeah, I'll go sure. to bed and suddenly I'm back on the boat and I'm like, I don't want to fucking be here. You know, I made that stance very clear when I was in the but Navy. But this was after the Navy, right? Yeah. Like after you were discharged. Yeah, yeah okay. that makes sense. I, I left school in sophomore year. And uh, whenever I did take tests, and still when I do take tests, I never was stressed out. So that's that's probably why I don't really have those and never really have. And that could be it. Like, maybe yeah. you're just like, you know, I'll get it in. But me, I was the type of person that's like, I'll show up early to class. So this is like, I got to get it in, you know? Otherwise, it's just going to sit on my brain and tell me that I'm going to fail if I don't. I've always been good at tests, and I, I've, I've just been very confident with tests, and I don't know why. I was terrible at homework, but <laughs> tests, I, I always, I, I would go in, and if a, if, a, if a class, if a class was like, you know, two-thirds of your grade is going to be the, the final exam, I, I would just not do any work and do the tests and pass. <laughs> Honestly, it wasn't until my senior year of college that I learned the trick to college, and this was passed to me from uh, my friend who was essentially uh, pursuing her PhD in biology at the time. She was like, you know, technically you just got to show up and show the teacher that 
you're actually trying. That's uh, very true, to be honest with you. That sure. is 100% true. And once I learned that, I like, calculus was kind of difficult for me, you know, weirdly, because I passed my finance classes very easily. <clears throat> but calculus, like, I wasn't doing so well. And so I started making a point to show up every single week and talk to the teacher about it. And lo and behold, I passed with the C. Now, do yeah. I know I got a definitive C? Yeah, and I, I worked full time the last like three years of my undergraduate degree and I was making bagels. So I would go into work anywhere between midnight and uh, like three in the morning and then I would work up until about noon and then I'd go to class from like one to eight or whatever. They used to let me sleep in class all the time because, like, they knew, right? Like, they yeah, knew. Yeah. yeah, they knew. And, like, every time I fell asleep, they would just let me sleep. It was That's wonderful. Great. And no every, anybody out there who's thinking, like, you know, you're skating your way through college or whatever thing like that. But here's the thing, guys. College is about problem solving, right? Mm -hmm. I solved the problem. I found an alternate you way did. around it. Also, a college degree, when it comes to it, like when you're getting a job, it's just a, it just shows that you completed something. Yeah, it, it just really shows does. That you can follow through it, really. <laughs> it <laughs> doesn't mean degree, shit. Got, like... <laughs> I got, as soon All as right. I got my finance degree, my dad was like, good, now you can work in IT. And now <laughs> here I am, like, fucking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 10 years later in IT. Yeah, it's, it's, it's total sense. Okay, we're going to talk about some brain activity. All right, brain activity and dream themes go hand in hand. Several bizarre features of normal-ass dreams share similarities with well-known neuropsychological syndromes that occur after brain damage, such as delusional, delusional man, uh, misidentification of faces and places. Well, that makes sense, too, because I think uh, like when you dream, like certain parts of your brain are engaged. So, like, facial recognition might not be like, at the forefront. Yeah, hold on. Let me reread that. Several bizarre features of normal dreams show similarities with well-known neuropsychological syndromes that occur after, after brain, brain damage. damage. Oh, okay. So, like, like what I'm saying is, like, so, like, y if you have brain damage, uh, what ends up happening is, is like, a part of your brain... Uh, not like major brain damage, but like a part of your brain is damaged. So like, like facial recognition is a big one because it's like done in the frontal, the uh, prefrontal lobe. And uh, if that's damaged, you might like, you might completely not recognize someone by their face, but you might recognize them by their smell or yeah, like face blindness. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, and that's like a very, that's a big thing with brain damage. Like, so like it kind of makes sense. Like I think with your, with your if you're dreaming i think different different parts of your brain are engaged at the time of the dream so maybe that part of your brain isn't engaged well i mean in the previous science of dreams episode we basically talked about how dreams are essentially a slideshow of the stimuli you experience in the outside world so yeah. well what's going on when you're dreaming is your brain showing you these images so if your brain is distorted from damage of course the images themselves are going to be I, I actually have brain damage. I was dead for uh, a little bit. And um, what basically what it means is like um, my long-term memory was impacted. So my life uh, before the event was basically is, is now um, jumbled. I have no, the way I put it, the way I explain it to people is that I have the data but no metadata. So I can't really like explain what was happening at the time of an event, but I can tell you the event happened and everything about the event, but no, nothing leading up to it. Nothing that like. So it's it. like the sequences are kind of out of order. Essentially. Yeah. I have no, t I have no timeline. So like I can kind of guess based on like w where the event happened, but I can't tell you what order all of it happened, and it's all a jumble. He knows the show existed, but he lost the itinerary. Exactly. Or I, I lost. I actually, the show is there, and it's all mixed up, and there's no, 
there's no show numbers. Oh. Yeah. Um, I actually, when I worked in uh, Pasadena, I worked with a guy who ha had a, had graduated from Caltech with a, uh, I think a physics degree, but he knew a bunch of people at Caltech too. And I told him about that. And he's like, I know someone who would really like to scan your brain. <laughs> 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 so we took lunch and we went down to Caltech and they scanned my brain and they were like, they're like, you work, so wait, you work in information security? I'm like, yeah, they're like, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, uh, that's classified. Yeah. I gotta go. So basically, the way it was explained to me is like, yeah, there's a there's a big black spot somewhere in my head, and my brain routed around it, basically. Man, dude, the brain is a really, like, an, elastic yeah. organ, man. Like It is. It really is. Um, my dad was dead for eighteen minutes, and uh, eighteen minutes. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm no shit. I'm not shitting you at all. He had a myocardial infarction. He was dead for eighteen minutes. He was in a coma for two weeks, and they saved his brain function by doing hypothermia treatment on him. So they brought his temperature down to seventy degrees. Does he remember slowly... anything? Did anything yeah. happen to him when he was brain dead? Oh no, he doesn't remember anything. I do remember shit from when I was, but he he. He has no. He actually has no memory of the day that it happened. Whoa, whoa, he just whoa. This is important to the topic. What'd you see? Okay. Um. Well, let's just say I uh, overdid it on uh, some substance. And uh, was it nail what polish I remover? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, yeah, I was huff... nail polish remover. <laughs> I was. I was. I was huffing paint, and. Uh, I overdid it, and and um, I remember seeing the things that were happening to me from the ceiling, looking down. So you asked oh, for so it's like an out of body experience. Yeah. I didn't see like a, you were out of body. Yeah, I didn't see a white light or anything. Um, my theory on that is, and this goes to my theories on death and everything, is that so what our brains are is like a bunch of like neurons shooting electri electrical signals to each other and when we die that just stops but if you if you think about like quantum mechanics or you know um uh what's it called thermodynamics or whatever like nothing is destroyed in the universe so my theory is that like whatever is happening up here like when you die doesn't necessarily just go away it just Go somewhere else. Well, okay. I mean, this is definitely much more a next episode topic, but to quickly yeah. touch on that, uh, people that see visions of heaven or hell, uh, my, my theory is that, like, while we're here on this plane within our physical bodies, we collect data, right? And at the end of the day, like, if you break it down to the fucking barest chemistry, we are pure energy. Mm hmm so when we pass away, uh, what we see when we pass away is formulated from what we decide ourselves to experience. Yeah, if we uh, feel like agree. we belong in hell, we create our own version of hell. Now, yeah. fuck. <laughs> so, oh, man, Alex fuck. is fucked. I don't, I don't know if I like that theory very much. <laughs> I just, I, my, I, I feel like when I die. Like I, I'm spiritual. I, I also am semi-religious, but like I don't. Ha my thoughts on when I die have nothing to do with heaven or hell. It's more like I just think my consciousness will wander the universe and it'll be bitching. I think my inquisitiveness will keep me very much grounded when I pass away, and like I think my depression is gonna send me to the worst fucking hell <laughs> ever. God damn, dude. Dude, it'll be like what it's dreams make. The lonely road. I'll I'll get you out, Alex. I'll be like, all right, yeah. I gotta go get Alex out of hell. You no, know, yeah, we'll pull you out because we'll, Kirby and I'll be wandering around, and we'll we'll come down and just just grab you by the arms and like rip you away. I'm gonna be Robert Williams following my <laughs> dead son. We'll be like, <laughs> we'll be like, come on, Eeyore. <laughs> we, come see all the dogs that have passed away. You know, come see your friends. All right, what? 
all dogs don't go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Look, dogs, dogs definitely, uh, their spirit ends up somewhere. And I believe it's on the same plane that we go because they have human tendencies. Uh, I agree. my, same with uh, meerkats. Yeah. Mir- <laughs> my dog, uh, tooth, you know, he will act like a kid. He, Dogs can generally get up to about the brain intelligence of, I think, like a 12-year-old. So he will kind of act like that. No, isn't it like a two- or three-year-old? I think it's more like an eight-year-old. Split the difference. It's definitely somewhere in there. (laughs) They get up there. I always always thought dogs were like two to three, and the pigs were like six to eight. But Um, he'll come into my room. pigs are smart as fuck. He'll come into my room and start barking at me to take him for a walk. And I'll be like, Toof, I gotta complete this Nightmare Dungeon in fucking Diablo. <laughs> you know, let me do that first, and then we'll go for a walk. And then he shits in your room. <laughs> no, actually, he's like, fuck you. He'll walk outside the uh, the bedroom door and plop down, and I'll hear a very audible sigh like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a just, smart be lucky, dog. just be lucky he doesn't shit in your room. <laughs> shit, shit in your bed like uh, Amber Heard. But, <laughs> I mean, they they experience human emotions. Like if I'm not here and Dad's not here and Mom's not here, uh, Toof is having anxiety. You know? Yeah, no, that is true. I wouldn't even call it human emotions. I mean, yeah. they, they it's emotions. They have emotions. They get emotions. Yeah, without without a doubt, a hundred percent. So okay. there, there's no way that we can't say they're not intelligent enough to experience an explain of existence. Well, I mean, I think that the um, the uh, the church would argue against that because humans are very special. This might All be right. controversial, but fuck the church. All right. Oh my god! Oh no! <laughs> so for all you lovers out there, next up we got relationships. This is dreams. a topic that's 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 been on my mind. So relationships and dreams. <laughs> Um, before we alienate all of the Catholics. <laughs> oh, we're going to lose them in the next season, so it's, it's all right. Man, oh God. Okay. Um, there are parallels between romantic attachment and the theme, the theme of the dream. A study involving 61 student participants uh, in a committed relationship showed a link between relationship-specific attachment security and dreams about their romantic partners. Uh, and then we've got death in dreams. Death in dreams. In one study, researchers uh, compared the dream content between different groups of people in, psychi- in a psychiatric facility. That sounds like fun. Um, one group of patients had been admitted after suicidal attempts. The other were compared against three different control groups in the facility, namely those who have experienced depression without thoughts of suicide, depression. Uh, I'm sorry, depression with thoughts of suicide, depression without thoughts of suicide, and carrying out a violent act without suicide. Those who had committed violent acts, attempted suicide, or thought about suicide were more likely to have dreams with content related to death or violence. One factor affecting this was the severity of the depression. Well, that's sad. Wait, so... Oh, now I'm confused. I think oh. I think it's safe to say that the rich fucks of the world who kill other people to get ahead in life suffer for it. That's no, I, so think, that so they don't. I think they're fucking sociopaths and yeah. don't give a flying fuck <laughs> at all. It, are, it helps are, me sleep better at night. <laughs> okay, these are people that like uh, uh, legitimately need need empathy. Like these are these are people that need help. You know, except for maybe carrying out a violent act, but like you know. Thoughts of suicide or suicidal ideation and stuff like uh, the thing that made me like kind of bummed was like the last that last little tidbit. One factor affecting this was the severity of the depression. So like, like it seems that if somebody was like acutely depressed and had you know thoughts of suicide or committed suicide, tried to commit suicide, like they were gonna have more dreams of death. Yeah, yeah, which probably just feeds in, like, it's got to yeah. be, like, an auto loop, right? Exactly. It just feeds into it, and then... Mm-hmm. I don't find that 
too surprising because depression. Oh, yeah, neither do I. Depression yeah, it's itself sad. is the snake that eats its own tail. Of course. You know, it goes on and on and on, and the only way to really break out of it is to like force yourself to start thinking and acting positively, or have friends that will pull you out of it. Or yeah, talk to a therapist, like just to get it, get the get the thoughts out there, so that you're not stuck in that loop spiraling. Yeah. Um. Uh. I will say that. Uh. Not that long ago, I was in a. Um. I wasn't institutionalized, but I did a. Uh, an intensive program for my depression, and I actually didn't have a lot of thoughts about death. Um. Or dreams about death, I should say. Uh. I don't remember what I was dreaming at the time, but like I was severely depressed and. Um. God, I wish I could remember the dreams I had. Well, see, I think I had a lot of dreams about sex, honestly. <laughs> For me, back in the day when I was really, really angry all the time and just hating everybody, uh, I usually solved that by just fucking downing a bottle of Jack Daniels, and then mm -hmm. I wouldn't have dreams at night. So I actually can't compare this. Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, that was before I got my CPAP. And um, when I got my CPAP, I was like, like the first night I slept with it, I was like, I had a bunch of dreams, and I was like, "Oh, I forgot dreams." Oh, is this Shit. normal sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> this is like, like, I actually was able to sleep for like a long period of time without waking up, you know, not breathing. Yeah, actually, now that I think about it, it's probably like, like the CPAP improved my mood. But this is I'm pissed because I just went to the diet. Well, just went to. I requested a sleep study to kind of get that ball rolling. Yeah. It's been four weeks, and I haven't heard anything from the doctor about getting the sleep study done. Yeah, it's, you, it, you started Diablo four weeks ago. That's the reason why you're having sleeping problems. No, no, no. He... Well, that, yeah, that may be one of the problems, <laughs> but I still probably need to get a sleep. I mean, I snore really bad, so yeah, they can help me really with that. Bad. Look, the CPAP changed my life. I had extremely bad sleep apnea like uh, they were there they would say that, the, that there were points where i wouldn't breathe for about two minutes and uh, oh, jesus yeah and like you know before the cpap like i was always like tired and grumpy and shit and like even if i got like a good night of sleep right like i went, went to bed early and got up late or whatever like you know i was still exhausted and it just it, the the thing is, is it, you're you're in that situation and it it becomes the normal thing, so you don't really think that anything's wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't even realize it because my ex-wife can't hear out of one ear, and she sleeps on her good ear, so she didn't know I snore. See. And, uh, and then finally, I was in a hotel room with my friend Taylor, who's been on around this, and he recorded me. Actually, he was like, bro. Yeah, he was like, you've got, you got to get a sleep here. study. Yeah. Weirdly, Taylor did the exact same thing to me. Um, He's a good guy. He's a good guy. I know I sleep. Like, I, I know I sleep horribly. Uh, I get, like, sounds maybe. Like, sounds <laughs> like he uh, may be an insider and has some type of connection with the, uh, the, the, the sleep fucking, industry. Yeah, the sleep industry. Oh, it sounds just... like. He's just a fucking, like... Oh, no. He should actually be trusted. He's just a point man for CPAT? <laughs> yeah. like... yeah. I'm calling you out, Tyler. Taylor. Taylor. No, he... Uh, he played me the recording, and, like, you know, you can hear me snoring, but then, like, I'll go... For, like, a minute and a half or two minutes. And then I'll go... And start snoring again. I know, I know I sleep horribly. I sleep, like, maybe four to five hours a night, tops. Uh, yep. And then usually I just substitute that with copious amounts of Red Bull throughout the day, um, which makes me very sleepy in the afternoon, so I either take a nap or drink more Red Bull. And then, it, like, I should be getting these studies, but I don't know. I'm riding this gravy train to the end. See what happens. Well... You know, I don't know. It's changed my life, and I started dreaming again. But 
but oh. Alex, you took them a while to like get back to me, and I had to like call them three times for them to like actually like pay attention. So maybe call you. Yeah, up. no, he he said he was gonna do the sleep study that they had to like contact the insurance, and he'd call me when it was all ready and set to go, and I could come pick up the machine. So and then they but looked at that. And I'll then they looked call. at the Activision yeah. front page and realized that Diablo came out on like a week after you <laughs> called them. <laughs> it was like, actually, fuck this guy. We're not wasting our time. <laughs> it's a different kind of not sleeping. <laughs> Anyways. Um, okay, so interpretations. What is racing through our mind as we fall asleep uh, could impact the types of dreams we have. Elements from our everyday life reemerge in dream in dreamlike imagery as we tra uh, transition through the sleep cycles. See, this is this is what was happening to me, right? I wasn't getting to the REM sleep ever. Um, for instance, nightmares are horrifying dreams brought on by stress, trauma, and fear that cause disturbing emotions and arise in us. That arise to arise in us. Sorry. Um, Students may uh, dream of exams, couples may dream of their partner, and stressed workers may dream of their job. Um, I, uh, right. So that's kind of everything that we talked about. Yeah, we already talked about that. It's like, and also, it's, it's a, some of this, some of this is, is kind of like common sense. But like, the thing I like about dreams is there's a lot of non common sense, like the grenade. Why? I don't know. Did you watch a lot of war movies when you were younger? Not really. My parents were hippies. We didn't have cable. Like, mm, maybe it's because your parents were hippies. Maybe. Maybe I wanted to put a grenade under my parents' bed. Maybe it's just a sign yeah. of anarchy. Actually, it's probably yeah. I um, mean, okay. At, uh, at your heart, you're an anarchist slash punk rock, uh, dude. So maybe that's the symbolization of your of your soul. Maybe, but I'm an anarchist with a capital A, not a. I, I'm not into anarchy and chaos. Although I do love anarchy and chaos, but I'm Listen, a. <laughs> the only thing I've ever wanted to do in my entire life, and oh. if I ever uh, end up on Make a Wish by I pretending to be school. eleven years old, no, I just want okay. to throw a Molotov cocktail, just one. Yeah. You've never to done that. Then just make a Molotov cocktail and throw one. In the yeah, fucking gonna... desert? Do you, like, I would set fire to half the goddamn town. Do you even know uh... what sheet grass are? Yeah, that makes sense. I can't Maybe... even, like, shoot a bottle rocket in here without worrying about, like, starting a forest fire. Well, Maybe yeah, build, build yourself, there. like, a little metal room or something. Outside, like a metal shed. Oh yeah, and throw it from <laughs> inside the shed. I'm sure this won't look suspicious to the you, parents. You or might the kill yourself in a fire I, that essentially I'm, turned into an oven. But I'm shocked that I'm the only one here who, with a group of friends when I was a teenager, made and threw a Molotov cocktail at a dumpster. Uh, yeah, I never threw a Molotov cocktail, but I did used to make like drawings out of gasoline and then light them. Well, that's even better. I like that. That artistic. Cool. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's creative, man. No, we just we. I mean, we'd make like homemade bombs and shit, and I don't know. One day we were like, let's try a model Molotov cocktail. So we filled a bottle with gasoline, put a rag in it, and then we were like, well, we shouldn't do this where we could catch anything on fire. So we went to the back of the Safeway and threw it in the dumpster. Which, you know, in retrospect, like. We were really wrong. <laughs> you know, speaking of which, uh, I was at work the other day, and the uh, the guy that runs the front of the store came back, and he's just like, um, you guys' dumpster is on fire. So I go walking outside, and there's just, like, flames shooting up out of the dumpster. And I'm thinking, like, hashtag uh, literal representation of my life. I <laughs> do the dumpster fire. <laughs> the literal dumpster fire. Oh god! Your life not that bad, it turns. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, the entire like this, the police chief of this like small town was driving by right at that moment, 
So he came in. Of course, since the police chief is there, the entire fire department had to show up. And uh, we had a whole kind of circus outside of our right. workplace for a bit. It occurs to me that um, I got suspended from school in seventh grade for setting a fire. And then I got in trouble in ninth grade for setting a fire. But uh, both times I was kind of able to weasel my way out. <laughs> So maybe I have a fire thing. Yeah, maybe the grenade is like the ultimate thing for you. Maybe you just want to throw a grenade. I really do. Oh man. Okay, we're gonna have. To, I'm gonna have to talk to my therapist about this. <laughs> All right. Uh, some common interpretations of uh, of themes, relationships, being an object in danger, falling, or being chased could be tied to our inter interpersonal conflicts. Mm, this is my favorite part. Sexual. Flying sexual experiences, finding money, and eating delicious food is usually associated with the uh, liberal and sexual motivations. This must mm. be why I'm always eating McDonald's in my... Yeah. Um, I'm always eating pussy. <laughs> like the cat? Yeah. <laughs> Bring that chocolate donut that over was here, a baby. Joke. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> <was> awful. <laughs> I just tickled myself. Oh. Anyways, uh, now I'm embarrassed. Speaking of embarrassment, fear of embarrassment. Great segue. <laughs> I just. We're not real great with the uh, transitions, but that <laughs> one nailed it. Yeah, that, that was like a straight Windows PowerPoint transition. And do you realize that we both just completely ruined the transition now by derailing it? Speaking of being embarrassed, let's talk about embarrassment. Okay. Being nude, failing an exam, losing teeth, arriving... I used to have that one. Ooh, arriving late and being... Uh, Underdressed is linked to social concerns and fear of embarrassment. Um, what about the thing that I said before? What What does that have to do with? What's the theme of uh, of performing the oral sex or the cunnilingus? Is that a theme? That's probably under sexual. Oh. I mean, I'm not a scientist <laughs> by any fucking means, but that's probably where I would put it. Yeah, but what if I'm doing it while I'm holding a grenade? That would be sexual. I dangerous. think that's. I, I think that'd still be sexual. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I also didn't mention that every time I have the grenade dream, I wake up wicked hard. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! <laughs> just go look up grenade porn and see. Uh, and see so what your happens. dick. So your dick is the grenade. <laughs> oh, uh, oh my god. It is shaped like a grenade, too. It's really weird. Was, man, I'd hate to see what happens if it explodes in your dreams. <laughs> your, your, your blanket is just covered in wet, sticky grenade juice. Oh, my God. All right, let's 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 move this along. We'll move it along. Nocturnal. We'll talk about nocturnal emissions in another episode. <laughs> um, uh, dreams may help people understand their feelings, beliefs, and values. Images and symbols that appear in dreams could have meanings and connections that are specific to each person. People looking to make, a, uh, to make sense of their dreams should look at each section of their dream and what it means to them as an individual. Books and guides may not be helpful as they are more of a blanket covering. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes I see. Sense. I have a lot of dreams about Trump being crucified. I wonder what that <laughs> means. Man, that's like you see Trump as Jesus. Yeah, you're look. He, he, he's a, he done it. Well, I mean, okay, you can either see it as Trump being the Messiah or Trump having a Messiah complex. Trump died for America's sins. Is what Alex is trying to say. God, oh. I wish he would die for America's <laughs> sins. <laughs> oh my God, you could start a QAnon style conspiracy here that Trump died fighting for America's freedoms in Iran. Oh, that's a Wait, great idea. Cause who, who, was on, who was on Fox earlier today? It's a, it's a deep fake. You know, oh my god! 
<laughs> Alex, <laughs> Alex, I, I, you know, this is really well thought out because conspiracy theories have never gotten out of hand in America. Dude, for real. Like, <laughs> that whole thing when they were like, JFK's coming back. Oh, I was like, God. no, he's oh. no, he's not. He's no. not coming back. Oh, God. Some people are still think he's doing that. Some people oh. are still, like, waiting for it. It's, it's JFK is not, he, he's, he's not coming back, bro. You know, we, <laughs> we, we saw his brains on the car. Yeah. He's not coming back. You can, you can, you can watch the video. It's pretty yeah. conclusive. He's not coming back. <laughs> Like, you know, I, I I do want to point out that the dreams uh, that help people understand their beliefs, uh, feelings, values, basically basically that entire last paragraph uh, overlaps with the esoteric belief of dreams. Because yeah, esoteric, for sure, yeah. yeah, the esoteric belief of dreams is a, is like it starts off by telling you, hey, this is just a basis, but truthfully. How you interpret your dreams are on a personal level. Yeah. That makes, I mean, yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, um, that's what Freud was saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Jung. Yeah, um, probably Jung more than Freud, to be honest with you. Yeah. But Well, Kirby and I owe a lot to Jung because he was instrumental in helping create uh, a certain group we're a part of. Really? We can yeah. talk about that outside of this, but I did yeah. not know that. Um, yes. He he treated he actually treated the guy who started it and actually was ba he had he had been trying to treat uh, alcoholics for a long time and and just had given up he was like I can't treat these people it's not they're 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 fucked they're not treatable wow and the group yeah. he's referring to is Heaven's Gate uh, we yep. just kind of missed the whole fucking uh, the whole Aiden. starship yeah yeah no well I I did I did castrate myself. Um, but they said to me, um, you need to live and you need to take Kirby with you and you need to castrate him and you guys need to spread the word. I just told him I was castrated. I was like, yeah, I already did that. Yep. I, that might be why my dick is shaped like <laughs> 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 it's awesome. That's that's what we call in comedy a callback. <laughs> Okay. Dreams and senses. I like this one. Okay. I'm just going to say this. So we talked about smells before. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like, and this is also scientifically proven, but smell is one of the most powerful sort of sense memory sort of things. So like if I smell something that brings me back to a memory, like it doesn't just like, I don't just have the memory. I like relive the memory. This is so, like, like whenever I drive by Taco Bell, I always relive the memory of drinking or eating a uh, fucking um God, what's my it's been so long. It's been so long since I've had Taco Bell. <laughs> but... Well, did you get a 12 pack of tacos and mow down on them? Yeah, oh, oh my god, those were my days, a man. Chalupa? I used to get a 12 pack of tacos half, uh, half crunchy half soft for everybody out there that's not that doesn't know what i'm talking about i live in a town with no chipotle or taco bell i basically have wendy's and mcdonald's and that's it for fast food mm -hmm. um so i used to get a 12 pack of tacos a half crunchy half soft and i would zoom through the crunchy while just like watching a movie and then i'd start working on the soft but whatever was left over i'd throw it in the fridge because soft tacos hold better in the fridge Dude, Crunchy Supremes were my jam whenever I went to Taco Bell. Cheesy Gordita so, Crunch is those things were so good. I like those double decker tacos that are like uh, a crispy taco, taco wrapped in a tortilla with. Oh, beans. those are pretty, those are pretty good. Yeah, I, when I used to skateboard, like that was like my lunch, like three of those. <laughs> you know, for podcasts that deals a lot with conspiracy theories and uh, paranormal. We actually haven't talked about the biggest bunch of bullshit that happened in the past uh, year, uh, and that was them taking away the fucking uh, Choco Taco from us. Wait, what? You don't know it's discontinued? The Choco Taco is no longer on the market? Yeah. Dude, I I showed up here, and I went to, like, a gas station. Uh, they had, like, four Choco Tacos left, and I'm like, I'm buying all of these. 
because they're about yeah. to be. That's yeah. really sad. It's... We what? Yeah. What they're actually doing is they're pulling it from the market, so when they reintroduce it from eighteen from eighteen months from now, they can fucking yeah. inflate the price. I mean, I would assume that's it, or. There, there is an alien conspiracy to eliminate the Choco Taco to make us more unhappy. That makes sense. I'm yeah. going to go with Max's idea. Trump, if he gets elected, will bring back the Choco Taco. And, uh, you Are you can... advocating for Trump? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why we're so Trump-heavy right now. What the fuck? <laughs> kind of, okay, so we all know that QAnon was created by, like, fucking 4chan nerds right yes um so i kind of want to start like i don't know putting the seeds of our own little QAnon conspiracy out there that people will start thinking is real no like <laughs> no i don't want to do that that sounds horrible one because we started this podcast being like hey Let's try to not muddy the waters anymore, and that does exactly the opposite well, of that. You know, the the best historical fact that I just recently found out about is that Ayn Rand oh. is actually a KGB agent. She was sent over by the KGB. <coughs> it's coming I from mean, the it, communist it, spy dude, that has taken over sense, Alex's bro. computer. Why would that make sense? She was all about individual bullshit. I hate fucking Ayn Rand. I fucking hate her. Everyone hates Ayn Rand, but the Republican Party has latched onto her like she's some fucking type yeah. of fucking god. And, and that is what that, honestly and that's and that is what has brought America down. You know, it's so kinda... really she's a KGB spy trying to facilitate the acceleration <laughs> of of <laughs> It's it's the actually free market individualist capitalism. It's oh actually God. kind of about it, man. Just think about it. It's actually it kind makes... of funny that the side that really hates communism keeps advocating for communism. <laughs> well, I'd argue they keep advocating for social or uh, uh, fascism, but that's you know we're tomato tomato. Fa yeah. I mean, communism is just another name for fascism. No, it is. No, it's not. No, yes, it, is, it not. is. Look, no, it's yeah. way more complicated than that. Yeah. Well, I, okay, so what? Some, everyone's Walmart's? equal, but some are more equal than others. You're telling me that's, Putin's no, down no, there? No, that's that's, so, com that's so communism in practice. So not first of all, theory. yeah. So first of all, there's never actually been communism. No, there has like in practice has well, not and existed. That's, and that's the problem. Like saying that something is communism is just painting over a coat that you're really running a fascist country. Well, yeah, yes, that is true. That's the problem. You're right. That's there, the problem. If you read the communist manifesto, if you read Karl Marx, like he's advocating for something that actually is like reasonable. Yeah. I know Marxism sort of. and I understand like power to the fucking workers, but it never works out that way because even like, let's say, let's take Aidi for a second or for example, uh, the revolutionaries down there, went out of their way to overthrow the government so they wouldn't be running under a fascist regime, and yet the very first chance that they get to take over the country and make it communist, the guy running the revolutionaries installs himself as a fascist well, dictator. Yeah, yeah. well, and I, then we're getting into Foucault and, like, this yeah. is not a philosophy podcast, no, but no. We, we should get back to dreams. But <laughs> that's why that's why then you have, like, 80 years later, 100 years later, you have Foucault yeah. and, like, his theory of power and how that dynamic works. But anyways, it's not we're, – we're totally off topic. Today, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess we kind of so are. If, if you want to read someone who's way better than Ayn Rand and makes a lot more sense, Emma Goldman, she was an, she was an anarchist. She was painted as a red – while she was alive by the by the government, but she was never a communist. When she went to to Russia, she was like, "These people are fucking crazy. I'm leaving." So, the Ayn Rand is a is a, a self righteous bitch, and Emma Goldman likes to dance. So, anyways, um, we're gonna get into okay senses senses. We're back to senses. <laughs> oh yeah, back to dreams. Okay. Research was conducted evaluating people with different types of headaches and the effect it had on their dreams. 
it showed that those with migraines had an increased frequency of dreams involving taste or smell. This could show that the parts of our brain, like the amygdala and the hypothalamus, are involved in the mechanic m mechanisms for a migraine, as well as the, me the mechanics uh, in our biological sleep and dreaming cycles. Another study conducted between 35 professional musicians and 30 non-musicians showed that the professionals had over twice as many dreams featuring music as the non-musicians. This actually showed that the dreams themselves were related to the, age, to the age in training of music as opposed to the daily bombardment of it. Nearly half of the, re, uh, half, half of the recalled, I'm sorry, nearly half recalled music that was not standard, indicating that music can be created in dreams. Okay, Ooh. hear me out. Hear me out. We're, we're going to get a little weird here. All right, let's, you, you remember that, uh, you remember that uh, text I sent you the other day, basically explaining the factors of life, where it's like, if life is all or vibrations, uh, then it boils down to cause and effect created by binary code, right? Yeah. So if everything is vibrational, I think certain people are more tuned into vibrations than other people, thereby making them musicians, able to create music uh, that resonates with the general populace because and find water and find water <laughs> because a quote unquote uh, to use a teenage term vibes. Well, to be honest with you, I don't really like how you ended that the quote unquote vibes thing, but not the point. That's because I'm older and fuck that word. But... Okay, boomer. But, <laughs> but I don't think it's just music. I mean, there's a lot of people that will have dreams and then wake up with epiphanies that, yeah. you know, math, uh, music, literature, like anything. I, I don't yeah. think that's just a musical thing. But Oh, I mean, 100%. Like, the whole world is run by vibrations. In fact, like, the whole, uh, the whole thing of the lesser key and the greater key of Solomon, uh, right at the beginning of the greater key... Uh, the one that essentially came about uh, like thousand years after Solomon. Uh, the guy is talking about how uh, invoking the name of God in different dialects uh, affects the demons that you summon because of the sound of his name. Yeah, that's actually like a big Jewish thing, right? We don't we don't invoke the name of God. And the God has four names in the in the Torah. And like we won't even we, we don't write the name of God. The name of God can be written by a very specially trained like scribe who's technically a rabbi too. But like uh, if you watch the movie Pi, do you guys remember that by uh, with Aaron Aronofsky? Life of Pi? No, Pi. Just called Pi. No, never heard of it. Yeah. Never. It's good. Um, it was the one he did before. Rec Room for a Dream, um, which it's better than Rec Room for a Dream. But basically, like, there's a mathematician in it, and he's, he's, he's uh, I think, an Orthodox Jew, and he, he's kind of trying to, like, he realizes that he can, he can see the name of God in numbers. And there's a lot of, like, Kabbalic sort of symbolism between, like, the written name of God, and again, it's not just God, it's Yahweh, Shalom, or whatever you want to, whatever's in the Torah, whatever. The, um, but like, I, like, oh, I know a lot of Jews that don't. They won't even if they're writing. If they're writing God, they will spell it G D D to just avoid saying writing the name of God. And to bring it back to what you were saying, Alex, yes, uh, vibrations can cause epiphanies in mathematics because mathematics is the way to measure vibrations. Yeah, I was gonna say so with the music thing, like. I've played music for a lot of my life, and um, I find that, like, my mind wanders back to just counting, because, you know, when you play music, beats and stuff, it's just counting, counting to four, really. <laughs> and, like, sometimes when I go to sleep, I find myself, like, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, and then some, I will absolutely, like, dream about music if I'm doing that. I just list off the names of people that wronged me throughout the year. <laughs> oh, that'll, that'll put you right to sleep, I'm sure. Fuck. What Jesus. the fuck? That took I've a turn. That. that took an unexpected turn. I've done that, and it keeps me up at night. 
um, I just, I, I start listing the names of God, and then I fall asleep, and uh, half the time I don't wake up. I'm just picturing Kirby. <laughs> like, right. October 31st, 1992. Some other toddler stole my candy. <laughs> like, I don't... I one of those gummy Bill, nerds Bill, and that Bill fucking Bill asshole took him. <laughs> January 23rd, 1999. Miss Sue's fourth grade class. She should fucking, not have called on me. Fucking Jill Tree. She took my marker, that bitch. <laughs> it was my favorite marker. <laughs> I bet it smelled real good. Um, all right. Okay, so realistic, localized, painful sensations can be experienced in dreams or through direct contact or memories. Though this is very low in healthy subjects. One study uh, interviewed 28 non-ventilated uh, ven burn victims. Wow. Non-ventilated, I'm sorry, I, did, I read this, but I forgot the intent. Non-ventilated burn victims for five consecutive mornings after their initial hospitalization. 39% of the patients reported pain dreams. Patients with pain dreams showed evidence of reduced sleep, more nightmares, and higher scores on the impact of event scale. They also had a tendency to report more intense pain during therapeutic sessions. Though more than half never reported pain dreams, this could indicate that the victims of, of pain have a higher tendency to dream about it than not the no normal ass folk. Freddy Cougar, baby. Yeah. Honestly, that also doesn't surprise me. I mean, because we were talking about external stimuli. Jesus. And if your whole body's on, like, fire, yeah, you're probably going to be dreaming about yourself being on fire. Yeah. Absolutely. Or you just, you're just, you're in so much pain that your dreams are just you screaming in pain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like this study was like, okay, we already know the answer to this, but let's just yeah. go ahead and do it anyways. Also, like, yeah, we're going to interview uh, burn victims and see if they remember pain. Dirty, like, right after their burn. <laughs> non oh, your whole body still feels like it's on fire? Tell me. What's it like when you sleep? I don't know. It feels like I'm on fire still. <laughs> Here's a Moltrin. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I feel like that's a study that didn't need to be done. Um, or you could have just, you know, they didn't need to do a whole study. They could have just asked a couple of burn victims, like, hey, uh, how's it like when you dream? Uh, I'm in horrible pain in my dreams and when I'm awake. Okay, good. <laughs> I wish I was dead. Oh, okay, yeah. so you dream of pain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Those with vision loss have fewer visual dream impressions as opposed to those with sight. Makes sense. People who have been unable since birth, unable to see since birth, report greater dream variety. <laughs> unable since birth. I know. I was like, what? <laughs> unable to see since birth, report greater dream variety in the auditory, tactile, uh, gustar, gustari, gustari, and olfactory uh, components. The ability to see does not appear to impact emotional and thematic content. You know, that's kind of crazy. Because your brain's essentially creating your own world. Images, yeah. That's, when that you're asleep. That is interesting. Um, I have something on that, but I'll tell you guys later. Um, uh, other disabilities. One study explored the dream diaries of 14 people with impairments. Four were born with a paraplegia paraplegia, sorry, and 10 were born without the ability to hear or speak. Deafness. The researchers showed that about 80% of those who were deaf gave no indication of their impairment affecting their dream reports. In the dreams, they could often hear themselves speak, hear others speak, and understand other languages. Paraplegia. Dream reports of those with paraplegia often had them walking, running, swimming, etc., they had performed none of these activities in their waking lives. Yeah, let's let's break right there. That's, like that's interesting. Your brain's literally creating these activities for you. And like the people that were born deaf, they are hearing stuff when they sleep. They're hearing themselves and others. It's so interesting. And either creating their own language 
or understanding languages. And if yeah. they're understanding languages, uh, could this speak to a connected neural network? Yeah, that's uh, that is super interesting. That is only accessible through our dreams. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that, uh, uh, and I don't know if this is really uh, pertinent, but um, I stopped uh, viewing any sort of porn about like 15 years, no, uh, 14, 13 years ago. And um, I got to say, my, um, how do I put it? My own alone time got way better. I I completely understand that because I personally stopped viewing porn about like 14 minutes ago. And <laughs> I just love how that kind of broke up on my end too. So I, I, I didn't really get the whole thing of it. I'm, I got, yeah, me personally, because I stopped viewing <laughs> porn about minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, 15 minutes ago, huh? Yeah, about fifteen minutes ago. Okay, and it's you know it's been uh, Wait, sensational. So you, have you just been watching porn while we've been doing this podcast? Is that do you just have another screen where it's just people fucking? I'm not listen. I'm not going to answer questions from a Chinese communist. Screen screen right. share right now. <laughs> no. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, my dreams. My I stopped fifteen minutes ago. By the way. By the way. Like the dreams I have about sex are way more like intense and um, usually involve like uh, I don't know an M16 and a ham grenade and a really good. That could be the reason. Maybe you need to watch on? porn and your grenade dreams will go away. Are you like a reincarnated dead Vietnam vet? Like I don't understand. <laughs> 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 I don't get it either. And you know what? The grenade, it's always the same grenade. It's one of those big pineapple ones that they had during Vietnam. He just wakes yeah. up smelling napalm. <laughs> I do. You know what? I do love the smell of napalm in the morning. Who doesn't? It smells like victory. And gasoline. <laughs> okay. Um, Cue another... Ride of the Valkyries, but go on. <laughs> I hate that movie, but I love that line. How um, do you hate that movie? You hate Apocalypse uh, Now? I don't hate it. I just, I think that if you're going to watch a good Vietnam movie, watch Platoon. It's better. No. So, okay. That's because Apocalypse Now is not a war. Uh, yeah, I know. It's it's more about, like, what the, psych, the psyche of someone in, in that situation. That, and, and I think it's way more of a cultural social commentary than it is like a than commentary a yeah than a commentary on like the culture of war if that makes sense i mean uh, i completely yeah, it's, no, it's definitely a far more personal experience uh the heart of darkness that comes from ptsd uh yeah. during the time like vietnam you know yeah and it was i don't know i just i really i've platoon is such a great movie i just i just it comes when it comes to vietnam movies i think i think it's it's just that you can't watch anything else. I do agree that Platoon is a better Vietnam movie. Yeah. But that's because Apocalypse Now is not, in my opinion, not really a Vietnam movie. It happens to take place in the setting yeah. of the Vietnam War. And then what? They go over to Cambodia or whatever. But it's well, it's yeah. not it's not a Vietnam War movie. Yeah. Or just well, watch it, the first hour of Full Metal Jacket. Because that's well, like well, the best part of that film. Oh, yeah, the second half sucks. <laughs> right when that guy shoots himself in the bathroom is when it just goes downhill. Yeah. Um, anyways, another study looked at the dream reports of 15 people who were either born paraplegic or acquired it in life and compared it to 15 people who were healthy. 14 of the participants reported dreams in which they were physically active as often as the participants who were not disabled. These studies seem to suggest that the brain has the ability to generate experiences that mimic life, including full functioning limbs and senses. People born without hearing or the ability to move are likely taping these into the into these parts of their brain as they dream, dream about tasks they cannot do in real life. Tapping. Tapping into the parts of their brain. Tapping, sorry, my bad. Yeah, they're not taping things onto their brain. Well, I, 
I, it it kind of worked in my head. Like they're kind of like taping parts of their brain. <laughs> um. Okay. Self awareness. One research study has linked frontal. Uh, I'm sorry. Fr uh, front. Front of. Uh, ha. Frontotemporal. Frontal temporal. I had it on the tip of my tongue too. I just um, gamma EEGs, electros, uh, cephalotic, uh, graph, uh, cephalographic, actively to co conscious awareness in dreams. That's really interesting. I totally thought that Isaac Asimov made up that word for the Foundation for, series. Frontal temporal. No, electro. And Electro stuff a little, yeah. uh, no, that's that, that's what an EEG is. That's that's what measures, you know, when they put the did not realize that's what an EEG stands for. Yeah. Now I feel really stupid after reading Foundation. <laughs> um I've read I read the whole Foundation series a couple of times, and I have I, to say that after reading it a couple of times, I did feel stupid. I uh just I just finished it for the first time. It's good. It's really good. Okay. The study found that current this is, by the way, I'm just gonna sit, preface this beforehand, like I have lucid dreams a lot. So yeah. the study found this it's great. The study found that the current stimulation in the lower gamma band uh recording REM cycles included self awareness or self reflective awareness in dreams. Higher order consciousness is related to oscillations around twenty five to forty hertz. You can attempt to accomplish this via YouTube with binaural beats. Yeah, I that's have, those are the beats that can get you high. I have been into that since the 90s when I read an article in 2600 the Hacker Quarterly about uh how to get high without drugs or just looking at lights or listening to sort of binaural beats. You know, technically if you if anybody stops like any like Let's say they've been off drugs for a while. But if they stop for 15 minutes of their life and meditate, you can give yourself a natural high. Yeah. Because it slows it's... everything down around you. And you walk out and the grass is greener and the fucking, yeah. uh, you know, the sky is brighter and the colors are nicer. Uh, but the thing is, nobody has 15 fucking minutes to dedicate to meditation. Um, you know what I, f so I found this out when I was a child. Um, I, w I was in a lot of like different therapies when I was a kid to figure out what's wrong with this old noggin. Um, and, uh, I did hypnotherapy and I, f and I discovered that for some reason I am extremely susceptible to hypnosis, like, which is something that I would tell you, like, you know, wouldn't really be me. But like any sort of guided meditation or guided guided hypnosis to go to sleep will put me fucking out like a light. That's good to know. Five you minutes. Why. I definitely I will know. never use that against you in the future. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you, buddy. Um, <laughs> How to hypnotize eat. my friends. Um, look up neuro linguistic programming, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> Are we talking MK Ultra shit? No, NLP is more like uh, speech patterns that can bring people either that can have therapeutic benefits or you can kind of use NLP in a sort of social engineering setting. Like if you oh. match certain. Are you saying I could be a cult leader if I learned this? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, the Nexium cult. Yeah. The chick, what's her, what, I can't remember her name. Nancy, Nancy Saltzman, not Nancy Saltzman. Yeah, Nancy Saltzman. The the sort of co-founder of it was a master of NLP. She studied it for years before she she started the cult. You know what? Let me go ahead and knock that on my things to do tomorrow. <laughs> that was another thing I got into from twenty six hundred the hacker quarterly was there was an article about NLP and using it in social engineering, it's just sort of matching matching speech patterns, sort of pausing and at certain beats can can sometimes sort of get people to do what you want listen i've got you know the aviators and charisma of like the 35 year old who plays diablo all day um 
So charisma of a thirty-five year old dude that plays Diablo all day. So I think I think I could be the next Jim Jones. Well, you know, okay, the Nexium thing, like, just because I've watched all the documentaries on it, and I think I find it fascinating for a few reasons, but um, Keith Raniere, I don't know how anyone ever found him interesting. He was always just full of shit. Like, if anyone told me they had the highest IQ in the world, I'd say, fuck you. I'm just going to start Probably telling people bitch. that. <laughs> like, or like you know he 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 was able he he verified it because he he took a non-standard iq test and scored very high on it and one edition of the australian version of the guinness book world records said that he had the highest iq based on that test wait but, is this like the fucking iq test you find on the internet that's like what color is red i think it was honestly and if uh, an orange is orange, then what's an apple? <laughs> yeah. I took one of those and I I, uh, I hacked the the JavaScript on it to just give me like a perfect score. So, <laughs> you know, um, I actually think that implies that you have a higher IQ than the test gave you because you take like, uh, that's like Kirk in the uh, it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's whatever a, that test yeah. is. It's the oh god, I can't remember it now. I just watched it too. Hiroshima test, I can't. Yeah, oh man, yeah, he couldn't. It's a test he can't pass, so he hacked it and put his own subroutines in it to pass yeah. it. Yeah, I love Kirk. <laughs> he was a bear of a man. Um, let's see. Uh, who dreams? Everybody dreams. However, at different points in our lives, our dreams may change. The Dreams of Children, a study was conducted investigating the dreams of 103 children aged 9 to 11 years old. Females tended to have more anxiety-driven dreams than their male counterparts. However, they were less likely to remember them. Thank God. The subjects of the girls' dreams veered more towards the loss of another person, falling, society disturbing, uh, society, socially disturbing situations, small or aggressive animals, Family members and other females they d they may or may not recognize. You know, so you're we... telling me a whole subset of people that live in a culture where they're demeaned, paid less, <laughs> fucking don't have the same health care rights, have worse dreams. Yeah, yeah they're, they're right. more anxious just in general. Okay. You know, yeah, I, I, I do want to point out we didn't talk about the guy's side of dreams in this. But I, I assume it's something like, what am I going to have for lunch tomorrow? Yeah, exactly. A, a, a girl who's between the ages of 9 and 11 years old is probably already worried about how she's going to get a job and make money and if she's going to have kids. There's a lot of things there. When I was 9 to 11, uh, I was probably dreaming about boobs. I was playing with lightsabers in the backyard. Like, <laughs> that was exactly as far as my uh, uh, worries of life went when I was 9 yeah. to 11. I think, I think this is, I think Alex made an incredibly good point there. Like, this study doesn't show that there's a difference between dreams that girls and boys have necessarily because their brains are different. It shows that the social pressures put on women and the the society's societal sort of, like, differences that are put on women cause them to have more anxious dreams i assume that if you did the same study with say like normal white men and black men black men are probably going to have a lot more anx anxious dreams because they're worried about getting pulled over they're you know worried about being discriminated against at work there's like a ton of shit that goes into that that has nothing to do with the formation of a brain yeah i mean i could definitely see the societal pressures uh, and like, especially from essentially middle school on up, uh, yeah. maybe even younger, I was never a girl, so I can't like attest to this, but I know that within those circles, uh, their, their pressure is put on them from the parents. Uh, yeah. the pressure is put on them from the school and the pressure is put on them from other girls themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, competing yeah. to be the best, like, yeah, within that circle. The social dynamic of, of, of little girls is a lot different. And at that age, 9 to 11, like, either they're 
going to get their period soon or they are just getting their period. So there's there's also that to consider. Like, And it, it, from a young age, girls are pressured to have children. I can't imagine being pressured from a young age to have kids. I wasn't because I'm a boy. It's I also mean, interesting, too, because 9 to 11 is kind of like that onset. Well, you brought it up, right? Period. Yeah. So it's like yeah. the onset of puberty. Yeah, absolutely. And like kids prior to puberty are very they're They're very much more androgynous right yeah exactly so i mean look there's a pressure on me to have kids like my dad is constantly like when are you gonna give me grandkids and i'm like well dad look at peter and his two sons i don't want that bullshit it seems (laughs) to say he has grandkids why are you asking you for him i know i'm like look how stressed he is all the time i don't need that Nobody ever pressured me to have kids. I just did it on my own. And you stupid <laughs> fool. I know I'm an idiot. <laughs> I had one. And I just had to keep going. I was like, you know what? Two's not enough. I'm gonna have three. I don't mean to talk shit about your children. I'm sure you love them dearly. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm gonna, I'll, I will admit that that have, having children brought anxiety that I never thought I would. Have. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, your kids are really cool. Like they are, but like, you know, I worry so much about like the world that I'm going to hand my kids or that the society is going to hand my kids. That actually keeps me up at night. I never God, had that problem dude. before I had kids. They're fucked. Yeah, every every generation passes. I tell that to my fucked. sister all the time. I'm like, dude, your kids just fucked economically, oh. climate wise. Like they just yeah. fucked. It's like. I mean, I'm going to hand them a, a an Earth that we're going to need to, you know, put a bunch of fusion engines on and push it out of the <laughs> out of the solar system. Now we're, we're that's literally, a callback. <laughs> yes, it is. We're literally at that uh, at that fucking point in Futurama where they shoved the trash out into the space. And we're yes. like, another generation will deal with that. Yeah. Like we're that or, fucking generation. <laughs> Or uh, when they're trying to get the water off the the comet and, like, the fix for global warming is just a big engine that pushes the Earth a little further from the sun. They're like, <laughs> well, what happens when it gets worse? We'll worry about it then. Just shout out July 24th, new season of Futurama. Oh, that's this month? Ooh. On Hulu, yep. yeah, July 24th. Oh, yeah. I know what we do in the shadows, I think, just came back. Also. It did. Shout out to Secret Invasion. I think it's the best thing MCU's done in a while. It is pretty good. And shout out to another full year of no new content. Thank you, studios, for fucking the working man. Yep. Um, we won't go into that because it makes people sad. I mean, truthfully, <laughs> Diablo and Starfield couldn't have come at a better time. Seriously. But I have watched Star Trek Discovery four times through. And I don't want to watch it again, but I'm going to have to. I'm not a big, okay, this is for, we can talk about it afterwards, but not a big fan of Discovery. Brave New Worlds is better. Dude, Strange New Worlds is the best Star Trek that they've come out with. It's, it's, of the newer Star Treks, it's the best one, hands down. Honestly, although Lower Decks is pretty good, too. Lower Decks is hilarious. Yeah, it's animated, so it's different, but. As, as I get older and look back on it, I still think Empire Strikes Back is the best. You know, it was originally Return of the Jedi, but I will fucking murder you if you ever, ever <laughs> compare Star Wars to Star Trek again. Are you yeah, hating on Star Wars? Listen, no, I love Star- I love Star Wars, but Star Trek, just objectively speaking, so is better. The better than yeah. the yeah, it's it so is. much better. No. It has such a better universe, such a more built out universe. Like the original it, trilogy beats them all. Nope. Don't care. Don't care. Nope. But this is a personal this podcast. Disagree. This is a... <laughs> so we must be right. <laughs> <laughs> this is clearly a personal preference. Uh, but no, it is. It is. I get it. I I do love a New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. It's a good. Th- it's a good series, but the the Star Trek universe has so much more. And Star Trek is more true sci fi. Yes. Right. Yes. Star Wars is. Star Wars is fantasy. It's a Star fun Wars fantasy. Is, yeah, yeah. What? Okay. No, 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 no. We could save this for the Stone Gauntlet. Both of you guys can be guest stars one time. 
Okay. Well, okay, but Star Trek explains all the science. Like, if you watch the shows, they explain everything from artificial gravity to warp speed. Yeah, they don't need to in Star Wars because it's already established. It's not, they're not going to be like, this is a lightsaber. In fact, they do. I mean, yes, it's yeah, I know like they do, future but it's, it's, science. It's fantasy, but, that, but if they don't explain it, that means it's fantasy and not science fiction necessarily. Yeah, Star, Star Wars is fantasy, definitely. Uh, hold the phone. Because <laughs> the, first, offer, man. the first real lightsaber has been built. And it's actually based very much off the now canned expanded universe lightsaber uh, that dealt with a backpack and a plasma blade. Uh, yeah, your main, you just proved us right because it's no. not canon yeah. anymore. It's yeah. you gotta toss it out, baby. Okay, yeah. it doesn't exist. With canon, no, 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 because that came after the original trilogy and before Disney shit canned everything. Okay, I'll just All say right. there's what a really good pregnancy book? dreams. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a really a hard. Book. We're gonna do a hard left turn here, boys. Yeah. <laughs> there's a really good book called The Physics of Star Trek, and it's amazing. Oh, there's I'll a, have to buy that. There's a it's really amazing. good book called The Rise of Darth Plagueis, and it's pretty amazing. Probably. All right. So the yeah, pregnancy. Right. <laughs> the about, pregnancy of dreams. Talk, let's talk about pregnancy dreams. <laughs> Studies comparing the dreams of pregnant women to non-pregnant women show that in non-pregnant women. Infant or child representations are less specific. Among those who are pregnant, images were more likely to appear in the later third trimester. Well, yeah, they're about to pop. During pregnancy dreams, themes tended to veer more towards pregnancy, childbirth, and fetuses. Childbirth content was higher in the later third trimester. Okay. The Pregnant group had more morbidity in their dreams as opposed to the non-pregnant group. Now it looks like we're about to get a lot more women with pregnant dreams. <laughs> what does that even mean? What? I don't know. Because <laughs> the fucking Republicans are banning fucking reproductive right. health care. Oh, well. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and anxiety dreams because these women might have kids that are still born and Man, stuff. Dude, this well, is fucked. I think this that's like sense. pregnant Sorry. dreams are kind of like the least of those problems that come that are coming out of that. Yeah. Well, okay. So is it look, weird that I had a pregnant dream once? Uh, I don't know. I what think I you, have two. Arnold it was right after, dude. Well, it was right after I had watched that movie, <laughs> and I totally and I totally for like maybe maybe like a week after I had watched that movie for the first time, and like I watched that movie in like high school, so we're talking. And I had like three dreams that week of me being pregnant. Well, I mean, it was a very <laughs> visual movie, like it depicted a man being pregnant. <laughs> that, yep, yeah, that's the entirety of the movie. <laughs> when, when, when the mother of my children was pregnant with them, I, I don't think I had any pregnancy dreams, but I had dreams about childbirth, like a lot, especially towards the the end of the third trimester. So was it, was it you giving birth or no, were you no. having dreams of? I didn't have dreams of me be giving birth, but I had dreams of like what the birth was going to be like, especially for my first child, because I had no clue. And then my other two kids, like I had, I, I would occasionally have like actually really bad. Now that I think about it, that I had like some morbidity sort of dreams where like something was wrong with my kid. Uh, uh, that must have been, yeah, that's got to yeah. be a shitty dream. Because there's a lot of you, there's a lot of stress there, especially especially towards the third trimester, because like you've carried, the you know the woman has carried the child that far, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong during childbirth, even it, with modern medicine. Like, you know, hypertension can be deadly. And, yeah, well, the U.S. I think the U.S. has. Yeah, we I think it has the highest infant mortality rate of any. First world country. Uh, first world country, yeah. It does. And that's mainly because we we uh we still force women to give birth like we did in the fifties. Um women women are, are the idea the idea in the fifties was you knock you knock the woman out before as she's going into labor and she wakes up and she has a baby and everything's cool. Well just wham bam straight to the moon. Yeah. I mean that that was the idea. Like that was the general medical consensus was we do an epidural, 
if we can use, uh, you know, laughing gas or anything else to just knock her out, and we take the baby out, and she's fine. Like, well, that's madame, not the case. That's not what happens. Welcome to the 1950s. Uh, yeah. We have no laughing gas, but we got this great <laughs> fist right here. <laughs> Don't worry. When you wake up, you will no longer be pregnant. Um, other countries, you like, so it wasn't until recently that, like, a lot of states in the United States actually made midwifery or midwives uh, illegal. And, like, recently that's changed. But, um, like, I was almost born illegally because my parents wanted to use a midwife, and that was illegal in California at the time. I ended up having to, my mom had a C-section, but, like, my, my, all of my children were born with midwives. Um, Mainly because like we did they, a bunch of. They came out with the kids. No, the instead of using a doctor, you use a, a like a a trained midwife or a nurse midwife. And instead of like, so the you know, Anora was born in a hospital, but with a midwife. Uh, Judah was born at what's called a birth center, which is nothing like a hospital, more like a bedroom, with a midwife. And Abby was born at home with a midwife. And one of the reasons we did that. And all my, although all those births were natural, is because when you add stuff like pitocin, which is what's used to to induce labor, or an epidural, the rate of a uh, problem happening goes way up for not necessarily for the baby, but for the for the mother. Um, oh, okay. So it's like you survived. Now here's all the other problems of society. Yeah. Have fun. Yeah. Or like, or like, hey, we we. we Doped you up and and you had this baby. Here's your baby. We need to do reconstructive surgery down there because you tore really bad. All right. So caregivers. Uh, I'm not even kidding. That's do the research. Great. We will. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's move on with the podcast. Caregivers. I was a caregiver. Those caring for a family member or groups of people suffering from long-term illness tend to have dreams related to that individual. A study was done for a year. At, ho- at a hospice center, and the results revealed that dreams were more realistic for caregivers and patients tended to be involved in them. The dreams reflected how the caregivers helped the patients, but they were also underlined with a feeling of helplessness for their condition. Another one of those things that just seems obvious. Just saying. Um, bereavement. Oppressive dreams are frequent in people who are going through bereavement. Once one study analyzing dream quality as well as linking oppressive dreams to bereavement discovered that these dreams are more frequent in the first year, were more likely to occur for those experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression. Again, did we need that study? <laughs> Anyone who's grieving probably going to have shit dreams. Yeah, I think yeah, the, o- the overall impression is that like, if you're having like depression... Or if you're facing problems, you're going to be facing problematic dreams. Yeah, absolutely. And whether it's whether it's uh, metaphorically in the dreams or very, very like literal, as with like uh, the 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 pregnant women, like they're literally having like anxiety dreams about dead kids. Oh, that's exciting. That's, that's exciting. <laughs> I'm sure that made a lot of people happy. In another <laughs> study, a kids get cancer too. Yeah. Aww. What the fuck? <laughs> Where did that even come from? <laughs> Archer. Oh. I thought you were just like stating the fact that kids get cancer. Oh. I'm like, well, that's fantastic. Well, I mean, they do. <laughs> yeah. they do. It's a fact. <laughs> when Archer What's... has cancer, he gets, <laughs> he gets chewable cancer drugs that What's are that? real. What's a great way to just fucking <laughs> down the podcast? Let's too. talk about cancer kids. <laughs> hey, Aww. I hope you guys aren't depressed already. Here's kids with cancer. Let's talk about that. Well, you should. Everyone should watch that episode of Archer because it's one of the best revenge stories ever. Yeah, in terms of him rampagement. Yeah, I love that episode. <laughs> okay. With the beads. Um, in another st- study, 270 people, it was de- it, of 270 people, it was determined that 58% reported dreams of their deceased loved ones with varying levels of frequency. 
Many of them had dreams where either, I'm sorry, many of them had dreams that were either pleasant or both pleasant and disturbing. Very few of them reported purely disturbing dreams. You know, that's kind of creepy, right? Imagine, like, you see your grandfather, and he had died by being eaten by wolves. And so you're looking at his casket, and half his face is torn off, and you're like, see you later, Gramps. You know, at least... Really no... shouldn't have done an open casket for that. <laughs> 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 at least there's no, like, wolves in the afterlife, or whatever. But... but... Then you go to bed that night, and your grandpa visits you in his dreams, but half his face is fucking torn off, because that's how you remember him. And you're just like, oh, good, this is the wolf in grandpa version. They're pretty good. Morticians are pretty good at putting people back together nowadays, I feel like. <laughs> that's true. Your fucking that's eyes true. just popped out, hanging there. Yeah. I... <laughs> I, like... I, would I would love to go to an open casket funeral. <laughs> Face torn off. This is pretty fucking metal, guys. <laughs> so he specifically requested it in his will. No matter how I die, make it open casket. And he really he frequented. Uh, he frequently camped where there were a lot of bears. <laughs> Oh, God, that is a great way to fuck up your family. I'm doing that. That's exactly what I'm doing. Actually, yeah, that's, I'm going to put that in my will now. I'll be like, no matter how I die, make sure it's open casket. I'm, I'm it's gonna... just a pool of blood. <laughs> I've always wanted to be taxidermied. Oh, my God, I'm After stuck I'm doing it. I've, I've always wanted to be taxidermied and then, like, at my funeral be placed in, like, some position as if, like, I am attending my own funeral. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that I wait. You want to weaken at Bernie's yourself at your own funeral? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> you need look. You need a wax version of you lying in the cast. Someone like that moves you. in different positions as if I'm like doing stuff. Like I'd be sitting in the pews and like yeah. the open casket would be empty, well, stinking up the place. Kirby was like, you should get a wax wax model of yourself and put it in the, in the Yeah, oh, that's and then it's idea. just you that would be legal. staring down at yourself, but it's wax, and you're the, the real you is the one standing up greeting everybody. Oh, that's fucking genius. I've never been to an open casket funeral. Um, it's like, I'm really going to miss Alex. Pats him on his back, his arm just falls off. Maybe record a few lines and have a recorder in there so when you do pat him on the back, it's like, hey, don't touch me. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm grieving over here for myself. <laughs> One, a couple of times when I was drinking with Nick, my cousin, Dr. Nick, he's been around, um, we both promised each other that, that whoever dies first, uh, the other one would, one, sing Sticks Come Sail Away at the funeral and then to give a three hour PowerPoint eulogy <laughs> <laughs> and make sure I'd that... get up. I'd get up and leave. <laughs> I think, I think appropriately I'd wait maybe about 45 minutes <laughs> and then I'd be like, I'm done. I'm done. Well, that's the point we wanted to empty wherever the funeral was being held. <laughs> Um, I really, I still, if Nick dies before me, I'm doing both those things at his funeral. Listen, guys, if I die, all I want you to do is just throw my body in the trash. All right, I don't even need this funeral stuff. Just toss it in there. I don't think that's legal. Well, you'll we'll, figure it out. We'll feed you to the mushrooms. It's okay. You're not, you're not even allowed to fucking bury yourself in your own property anymore. Fucking I know, it's lame. Or Pickles. other people for some fucking reason. Or, right? You know, when I my house, I used to own a house with a backyard, and it was full of bodies that I put in there. Full, full. <laughs> um. Anyways, <laughs> um. Jews Jews don't do open casket funerals because we don't embalm our bodies, and we have to be buried within three days. And we don't have cat. We don't. Ha we we use pine boxes, not caskets. Oh well, it's a lot better for the environment. I mean. Honestly, it just makes I, to me that's like, why would you need to see your dead grandma's face? Like, oh, oh, yeah. 
I don't need people looking at me. Actually, I don't even give a shit. Like, whatever happens with my body after I'm dead, my spirit's already gone. So do whatever you want. Give it to Jeffrey Dahmer. I don't care. I really don't. I would like someone to pump my penis so that I'm erect during my funeral. <laughs> 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 uh, He's having he one last grenade hilarious. dream. <laughs> How'd he die? <laughs> Okay, prevalent themes included pleasant past memories or experiences, deceased being free of illness, memories of the deceased illness or time of death, the deceased in the afterlife appearing comfortable or at peace, the deceased person communicating a message. Ooh, excuse me, 60% felt their dreams impacted their bereavement process. Oh, this next one is my favorite, by the way. Oh, yeah. Drug withdrawal. Okay. One study following a group of people who frequently use crack cocaine <laughs> during an abstinence, almost 90% of the study reported drug-related dreams in the first month, mostly using the drug. 61% had drug-related dreams after six months. These would be either using or refusing the drug. So you could say crack cocaine gives you awesome dreams. Oh my god. Okay, and again, this is something that Curry might kind of know a little bit about. Uh, I never abs- did crack cocaine. How would I know about this? Okay, I'm substance. <laughs> when you abstain from substance, yeah, for the first, like, I don't even say six months, for the first year, you have a lot of dreams about that substance, whether you're refusing it or doing it. I think, right? okay, when I abstain from alcohol... I had a couple of dreams about, like, you know, going out and trying to grab alcohol, but I think that falls far more in line with the societal issues, where mm-hmm. it's like, everybody's telling you not to do it, you're going to dream about doing it. Um, and then, like, fucking, as far as, like, dreams on alcohol, I wasn't kidding when I blacked myself out every night. Oh, yeah. I did not dream. You don't usually dream when you do that, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, when I was coming off of dope, like, I had a lot of dreams about, about getting high. And, I, and and then when I, and I had a little bit of, like, you know, distance between me and, and drugs, uh, I would occasionally, not very often, have a dream where I relapsed. And, like, the dream would be all about, like, and I'd wake up and be like, holy shit, did I just do that? And, like, oh, it was a dream. And I think so. I think that also falls in the line with like failing the exam or yeah, I, I I agree not being there on time. You know, it's like you have this pressure on you to be a better person, to strive to be better, and you're gonna falter in your dreams, and then you wake yeah. up and go, "Oh, that was just oh, a okay. dream." Yeah. You know. I but I will say that like in the first year, and maybe this is just like a testament to like crack cocaine or heroin or whatever. Like my dreams were full of being high and and doing the deed actually a lot of dreams i had um more focused on the ritual behind like administering drugs to myself like and and i found that not only was it my dreams like when i was when i was doing this for for, for the first year or so the cravings I had weren't revolving around getting high. The cravings I had revolved around the process, cooking up something, snorting something. Like I mean, that's again got to be like the ritual, right? It's it the ritual. Such, yeah. It was such an ingrained habit yeah. that, like, I I didn't necessarily miss being high, but I absolutely missed the feeling of, and this is gonna sound crazy. I missed the feeling of the needle going into my arm. Well, yeah. I mean, it's the same as, like, the cigarette burn. It's the mm-hmm. cigarette burn. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I misspoke. I actually did cocaine back in the day for, like, a couple, like, a month or so. Maybe a yeah, couple yeah, yeah. of them. Uh, but I realized I was using cocaine to drink more. I was like, yeah. I'll just get rid of the middleman because this is very much could be a problem. I was far more a psychedelic fucking user because acid could give me dreams in the real oh. world. You know? Yeah. Man. Oh, I don't want to talk about acid right now. Because if I do, we'll be here for another two hours. Um, 
I miss LSD. Okay. Can dreams predict the future? This is my favorite. This is my second favorite section, by the way. Some dreams seem to predict future events. Some researchers claim to have evidence that this is possible, though not enough of to prove it con conclusively. A lot of times it seems uh, to be a coincidence, false memory, or the unconscious mind making connections. However, in the next two episodes, I'm looking forward to this, we're going to explain from a spiritual point of view why this could be possible. Now, strictly speaking, from a scientific point, since we're on the scientific part of the podcast, um, the... The prediction of a future event can be explained by simply connecting the dots beforehand. Like, if yeah. you know that an airplane has a fucking faulty fuselage, and you know it's taking off tomorrow, and you fall asleep and you dream about the fucking airplane exploding, and then it goes up and it explodes, that's not a prediction of a future event. That's connecting the dots. Destination shit right there. Yeah. That's... That's a recognition of a problem, you know? That's a, that's just negligence. <laughs> that's the same thing as, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, it happens. I mean, the Titan I know, submarine, I like, every single person on the fucking planet was like, don't take that down to the fucking Titanic. Oh, yeah. Dude, you dumb fuck. It's know. one of the most infuriating things in the entire world. You know? Even, even so, I don't know if you guys watch uh, Expedition Unknown on History Channel. I kind of love it. Um... Even that guy, Josh uh, Gates, he had a chance to go down on that submarine, and he has done some weird shit on that show. Like he, he's a professional diver. He's gone. He's he's done dives uh, below 170 feet, which is like very dangerous, like helium type dives. He wouldn't go in that. He he actually refused to do a show with that because well, it wasn't safe. Neither would I. I'd be like, no, I'm not going down in your vegan fucking submarine. Exactly. That's like half put together and with duct tape. Get the fuck yeah. out of here. If every submarine expert that you bring on board is like, don't do this, uh, you know, maybe don't do that. I don't know. Yeah. Oh god. I don't know. Well, or, um, what was the the was it the seven the seven six seven X whatever you know the the plane that that they had to like basically like ground because it the computer would tell you that the 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 elevation was not the real elevation. Oh and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that the the Boeing engineers that worked on that who tried to tell people that it wasn't safe had a lot of dreams about plane crashes. All right, so uh I I think that's it guys. Let's wrap it up. Uh, I want to do some quick shout outs. Everybody that's tuning in for the first time, uh, this is how the normal episode generally goes. The previous episode, uh, the double secret probation of Skinwalker Ranch, was a bit loosely put together uh, and based more off our experiences at Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, so what you're seeing with Scientific Dreams is typically our layout. Also, I want to do a quick shout out for... Uh, uh, my friend Tommy Mahoney, he sells hot sauce out of West Virginia. Uh, if you look up his Facebook page, Tommy's Original Sauces, you can get two for ten dollars. That's two small bottles, uh, or one large bottle for ten dollars. Shipping is available. Customers pay for USPS priority mail shipping, uh, and it is the best handcrafted, grown and made sauce from Drakeswood and Wood, West Virginia. And West Virginia knows that shit because they make some fantastic fucking moonshine down there. <coughs> yes, so, they do. look this guy up. Uh, if you like some fucking hot sauces, he names all his shit off cryptids like Wendigo and Skinwalker. Ooh. Definitely worth looking into. I'm going to try it and I'll let you guys know what I think. I also want to point out uh, we are available on all platforms, not just Spotify. You can find us on the Apple uh whatever podcasts <laughs> apple podcasts and everywhere that you can find a podcast that is where you will see us uh Stitcher, all the ones our typical uh format is we will stream live on twitch then you will see it available on youtube within two days and then about a month later you'll see it pop up on the podcast uh section after we've edited it and gone through the various things You'll find the raw, uh, unfiltered versions of it on YouTube. 
Uh, another shout out to John Zara for allowing us to use his ending music, Old Lang Syne. Uh, thank you to him. And I just realized I said, uh, like 50 fucking times there. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else got anything? Uh, I really like the smell of my own farts. That's 52. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I won't let this podcast ruin my life. 5354. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. We'll go ahead and sign off, guys. My yep. name is Kenny Crook Irish Kirby, and keep it weird. Uh, my name is Maxwell Murder, and uh, I didn't. What? Nothing. Go on. Oh. And I didn't murder all the people in my backyard. Uh, and uh, I'm special guest Alex, and I did 56, murder 57. all the people in this backyard. I'm <laughs> counting the amount of times we say, uh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I realized that after 54. <laughs> Max, stick around. I want to talk to you after the podcast. Hey. And we are basically going into the end. The music's still playing, so it's not over yet. Can we talk now, or the what? Can we talk now, or, or we have to wait for the music to play? Uh, they can still hear us. Oh, okay. So no, we can't talk. Everyone just be <laughs> silent. Yeah, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I think. It, what? I think. It, well, this is, this will be a little tidbit for people who stay at the end. I think I've said this before, but uh, when I was coming off dope, when I was on dope, like you know, if I was like using on a bender, and I was coming off of it. Uh, I knew that the withdrawals were going to start because I would have like a vivid, vivid sex dream and a nocturnal emission. <laughs>